Hey guys, um, welcome back to Bed Talks. We have a different marker color today because my green one is a little bit off. So what are you talking about today? Uh, chapter 15, getting into chapter 15 now. So where have we been heading in calculus, right? Calc 3, the whole big picture. You always want to just kind of figure out where we're going with this. In chapter 12, we talked about the idea of vectors, and how to write equations for lines and planes. Chapter 13, what we did is we extended that idea of how do we write equations of lines and um, try to understand how we tackle kind of combining, you know, the ideas of how to write lines and equations of, of, of planes and lines and parametric equations um, using vectors as well. And then what we did on top of that, in chapter 14, as we decided to say, okay, now let's go back to Calc 1 really quickly, extend a lot of the Calc 1 stuff that we were talking about with now kind of vectors too. Uh, you know, we dealt with the gradients, um, how to do partial derivatives, extending multivariable, and going to multivariable functions. And we talked about differentiation, how tough that was in some way to think about the idea of slope. And now what we're going to do in chapter 15 is take that, we're going to kind of put aside for the moment vectors. We're going to come back to that hard in chapter 16. But in chapter 15 right now, we, to get ready for that, we need to tackle integration. And how do we go about integrating in multiple dimensions? And what does that actually physically mean? Right? So what I'm going to talk about first is, let's go back to the idea of one dimensional, just f of x, and what did that integration actually physically represent? So what does it physically represent, right? So if I have this function here, this function f of x, something like that, and I told you I wanted to find the integral from a to b of f of x dx, say a was here and b was here, what did this actually mean? What this meant was we were actually finding the area under this curve. Right from the curve f of x to the point of to, to zero, right to to the x-axis here, trying to find this entire area, and this is what this physically represents. This this represents an area, because I had a height, right. And now, what did I do? What did we do to get to that point, right? We used something called Riemann sums. Well, what Riemann sums were were a way to approximate this. So if I was to kind of you know rewrite this now and talk about this a little bit better. So if I had A to B here, and I wanted to approximate this, what I did, and this is actually kind of an interesting way to go about it, I can approximate this with rectangles. So I subdivided my X domain here. Let's say I subdivided into, you know, maybe, that seems about right, I subdivided into four different parts. And this is, we'll call this delta X here. This is the same for all of these delta X. And from there, what I did is I said, okay, I'm going to pick a point somewhere in this, you know, in this little subdomain, that's a uh, subinterval here. Uh, let's call it, for instance, the right endpoint. What I did is I went up to the right endpoint, I went up to my function height, and that was considered my function height, and that was considered the height of my rectangular domain, right? And what I did is I could take the right endpoint again and do it this way, the right endpoint and do it this way again the right end point and do it this way. And if, as I get delta and delta smaller, you know, what we do is we add up all these possibilities here. Um, we add up all of these contributions. And as I make delta x smaller and smaller and smaller, infinitesimally small, I get to the exact, exact, um, you know, area of it, I get area of that. And so this is what we did. And why did we do this? Kind of writing this out, we said, okay, well, we were really taking the sum of the function height, right? Kind of thinking about what this is, this is length times width, each one of these. The width here is delta x for all of these. And the height is just the function at some point in my i domain, i equals one to n, let's say. And what I did is this sum was saying from i equals one to n, and this is how we kind of write this, this summation idea, using that back from series and sums back in Calc 2 is this was my height and this is my 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 width like base times height almost we can extend this now in the same idea to calc 2 calc 3 or sorry, two dimensions here so let's think about what this means now so say i have some surface right i have some surface now 
And it has its heights at every single point. It has its heights everywhere. Maybe something like this. Maybe it has its heights at every single point. Maybe some points have a little bit higher, lower. And I can kind of um, put a shadow on it. And that shadow that extends and make a volume with that height over some domain is the idea of an integral now. So I have this function, let's call it f of x, y. I have this function f of x, y. And it's some domain, something like this up in here, something like that. And what I'm doing is if I want to try to find or even think about what is the idea of an integral here, right, what I do is I project this kind of down. This is, this is my function f of x, y. And I kind of make my domain here again in the same way. And what we kind of think about is the integral here is going to be the net volume from my function height to the x-axis, to, to the xy plane in this case. So an integral here represents net volume. Now, as a reminder, in, f, in the integral from f of x, right, in this guy, this could also be negative if we were below the xy plane. Right? It could be zero. It was kind of net area. In this case, it's going to be the same exact idea. The integral, we'll call it the double integral, we're going to call it this, of f of x, y, dA over some region D. This thing right here represents the net volume from my function height at f of x, y, which gives me a z coordinate for everything, all the way to my x, y plane, is how much volume is in there. Now, it can be negative as a reminder. So this could be a negative value, and that's absolutely OK. Just be aware of that. It can be. So now, how do we go about approximating this? You can kind of think about, in the same exact way again, let's take a really, really easy thing. Let's take this, let's assume that this is a rectangular domain. A rectangular domain. This is kind of what we start off with here. What we could do in the same way is we could subdivide the, the x-axis and the y-axis now. And we could form, I'll draw it a better picture in a little bit. We kind of form these little areas down here, right? Each one of these is its own little area. And again, what I could do with each one of these subdivided parts now, I could find a rectangular prism that approximates that little portion right above that subdivision. And by doing this over and over again, right, and finding all of these rectangular prisms in all of these, what I could do is then start to approximate the actual volume of this. And that's called a double Riemann sum. So let me be more specific here. We'll do an example of how to do kind of a Riemann sum, and then we'll get to how do we integrate in just a general, a general over a general rectangle. So say I have a function f of x, y. Okay. I have some function f of x, y here. And I want to compute the integral of this. I want to compute the net volume over some region. Let's call it from a, we'll call it from a to b, and we'll call the y from c to d. So this is a rectangle. So let me draw out what this rectangle is. Let's call this a, let's call this b, let's call this c, let's call this d. This could be anywhere in my domain. I'm just doing it in the, um, you know, the xy plane. And, and not, not sorry, I'm doing it in the positive, the first quadrant here, just to, to make it a little bit easier just to draw out. I'm not the most talented artist, unfortunately. Now, what do we do here? In the same way as we did back in the one-dimensional case, we subdivide our domain. I'm going to subdivide the A to B in M subdivisions, OK? So we'll call it this way. So boom, 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 kind of like that, right? I'm also going to subdivide the C and D domain. We'll call it the N subdivisions. Boom, boom, boom. I'm going to do N subdivisions here and M subdivisions here. In this case, I have, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, maybe, in this case. And what I can do is I can start to draw how this got subdivided now. I'm basically a landlord, and I'm telling everybody where they can live. Kind of like that. And so what I've done now is my rectangle, I'm going to name this rectangle R. You have to name it something. You can name it Bob, whatever. I've named this R. It's a little bit easier. 
Every single one of these individual rectangles, I'm going to name something like R-I-J. Because I can kind of imagine this is, this is kind of like um, the, the, the first rectangle, the second rectangle, the third rectangle. I'm going to call these individually something like R-I-J. I is going to be related to, we're going to say, I is going to be related um, to the X component, right? So something like this is, you know, this is X1, X2, XI, kind of thinking about it this way. And the same thing up here, this would be YJ, stuff like that. So IJ, I can talk about this specific rectangle. And what I'm going to do now with this RIJ, with this very specific RIJ, is I'm going to try to calculate the rectangular prism that starts to approximate this. Because you can imagine this, over this rectangle, I have this function height. It could be into, into the wall, it could be out of this wall, right? Kind of a, can imagine like I'm pulling this entire function out into different ways to get the height of f of x, y at every single point. I have now constructed this mesh here, as we sometimes call it in, 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 in math. We call this mesh, because it looks like a mesh. What I'm now going to do is think about, well, what's the area of all this? Right. Every single one of these has a change in area, right? The change in area here is really this delta x, right, and this delta y, we can kind of think about it. It's just delta x times delta y. Right? It's just this delta x times delta y. All of these areas individually are delta x times delta y. Let's assume that's kind of a, a, you know, a regular domain like that. Now, how do I come up with a rectangular prism? We know it's length times width times height, right? You're kind of thinking about it that way. I have my length times width. This is my length times width. Delta x times delta y. This is my length times width. Now I need the height. What is the height? Well, what I need to do is I need to pick a value inside of here in every single one of these. Doesn't have to be the same in every single one. We're gonna have some, it's much easier sometimes to pick <laughs> the same one, but it doesn't have to be the same one everywhere. What I'm going to do now is I'm gonna name this guy, this guy, I'm gonna name as a sample point. X i star, X i j star, and Y i j star. What this does is it says, okay, I am picking a point that I'm gonna I'm gonna denote that I'm gonna find my function height at. I just pick one, right? Because that's just gonna be my height for that rectangle, rectangular prism. That's gonna be just that height. So in order to do this, what I'm gonna do now here is I'm gonna calculate f at that point. And that's going to be my height, right? Now, many times what we'll do is we'll pick the same type of point at every single one of these, right? We'll pick maybe the middle point at every single one. Maybe that's easier. Maybe we'll pick the top right corner. We, we've done a couple of these, right? Back in Calc 1, you saw maybe, you know, the right hand at the midpoint rule, the left hand inside, maybe using Simpson's rule and stuff like that, a little more complicated. But what we're going to do now is we're just going to pick a very, very, very specific one. And we're going to calculate that height. So you can imagine that this volume change, this volume change in every single one of these is going to be really about, you know, this delta x times delta y, which is my length times width, and then my height, which is f of x i j star, y i j star. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate this for every single one of these. Adding all of them up gives me my Riemann sum and an approximate volume. So we can write it like this. So we can say that the volume then is approximately equal to, we're gonna run through all the possibilities and this is how we do it, by using a double Riemann sum. What a double Riemann sum says, it says, okay, I'm gonna run from all my possibilities from I equals one all the way down to I equals M, by right? all these different points in here. All these different points. I'm gonna pick every single point out using all these i's and j's. So I'm gonna go in this column, I'm gonna then go in this column, I'm gonna go in this column, and go in this column, and go through that process. I'm gonna then calculate delta a, every single point. This is gonna be the same for all of our cases, which is good. And then I'm gonna pick my sample point, the height at that value. I'm gonna calculate, what this says is, I'm calculating all of the rectangular prisms in this entire in, in entirety. And this is called a Riemann sum. And this approximates the double integral over my rectangle of f of x, y, dA. This differential here is, a, is an area differential now. And because of this exact fact, this dx times dy.
differential tells you how you know kind of kind of in, in which which domain I'm kind of in. How where am I going? Where am I moving? Am I moving in the x and then the y, the y and then the z, um, something like that as we go forward. How do we use this formula? Let's do an example. So if I take now, let's assume that I have something. I think this is actually a web assignment question, but it's actually still a very good question to do. Because actually, it shows you how to use this. So let's assume, I'm going to leave this down here just for right now. Let's assume I have f of x, y is equal to x times y. Maybe it's like z is equal to x, y. Some interesting function like this. I'm on my domain. Um, I think it was 2 to 10. 2 to 8, sorry. 2 to 8. And then 6 to 10. And the y. So this is saying x is between 2 and 8. Y, X, y is between 6 and 10. I'm going to let m be equal to 3 and, y be e and n be equal to 2. That means I'm going to subdivide my x domain into three parts, and I'm going to subdivide my domain in the y in two parts. And I want to approximate the area or the volume of this. Now, what does this volume actually mean? This says I'm going to take this area right here. Let's call this 2 to 8. And then we have. 6 to 10, not in scale. Please do not, please do not be mad at me. I have this rectangle. At every single point here, I calculate f of x, y. I get this kind of interesting dynamic up here. What I'm again going to do is I'm going to try to find the volume of this f of x, y above this, above this rectangle. And I'm going to try to calculate the net volume in between that, that, that surface and this x, y plane. I'm going to do this by approximating it. And then what we're going to do after this is to calculate this ex explicitly by using some formulas, by, by using that um, as well as we'll talk about some rules. So how do we do this? I want to subdivide this into three ways. So let's subdivide it here. So this is going to be four and six. This gives me three different subdivisions. If I want two subdivisions, I'm just going to subdivide this as eight. And now I get my nice little subdivided work right here. I now want to approximate this, and the problem, I think, it asks to subdivide it using the sample point in the upper right corner of each square. So what does that actually mean? Well, let's first off calculate something interesting. I want to calculate this delta A. This delta A is going to be the same for all points. Delta A here, well, what is my change in X and my change in Y? My change in X here from 2 to 4 is 2. My change in Y here from 2 to 4 is also 2. It's from 6 to 8 is 2. And so the area of each one of these is equal to four. That's good to know. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, I'm going to sample from the top right corner, the upper right corner of each rectangle. That is the sample point I am picking. That is the xi star, xij star, yij star. It's going to be this point, this point, this point, this point, this point, and this point. OK? So what this is actually saying is I want to approximate this volume is approximately equal to using this. I'm going to write this fully out because I'm going to, I'm going to be as, as, as explicit as possible. This delta A, which is the same, so I could factor this out since it's all the same, I could factor this out. What I'm going to do then is I'm going to calculate the function height at each one of these points. So let's think about what each one of these are. F at this point right here, this upper right corner, is 4 comma 8. Let's just keep going in order. 6 comma 8. This one is 8 comma 8. Now I'm going to this top one. I'm going to go to uh, 4 comma 10 plus 6 comma 10 plus F at 8 comma 10. And if I, fa if I factor those delta A, these are all volumes of rectangular prisms. And I'm adding up all these volumes to kind of approximate the value of this. And so now doing this here, we can actually go in and literally plug in x times y. Right? This is f of x times y. We can go through this entire thing. So delta a here is 4. We just multiply each one of the components in this case. right? It's x times y, so that's how we evaluate. So this is 32, 48, 64, 40, 60 and 80. And I am not going to calculate that, I think. Um, I can really quickly. 4, 
times, this is going to be 160, um, oh no, 180. This right here is going to be another 70. We have 64. So it is something like 250 plus 64. 250 plus 64 is 314 times 4, which is equal to 1256. And so that, I hope I did the math right. It's, but up to this point, I hope everything, up to this point, I hope everything is correct. So what does this tell me? This tells me if I use the upper right-hand corner, I'm going to get 1256 as my sample point. So what we do, again, is a Riemann sum. What we do is we take the function heights at specific points, right? These are going to be my heights. I'm going to take this point and stretch it all the way out until I get my point, until I get to my function height. Stretch it out until I get to that point. And that's what this entire rectangular prism is. If you want to use the midpoint rule, which is a very, very good one to do, you take the middle of every single one, and you take these guys. And so this point might be 3, 7, this might be 5, 7, and so on. Midpoint rule, most of the time, is much more accurate than the left-hand, right-hand rule, but it really depends. Um, midpoint rule is usually your best way to go, but then it probably asks you to the top right corner. Sometimes you'd only need a very rough estimate in that case. I think it's probably going to be over... Um, probably a little overestimate here, as we'll find out. Okay, that's the idea of Riemann sums. Now, I have Riemann sums, that's all cool and well, but this is really tedious, and I have a better method of actually just actually explicitly calculating it. Um, so let's go ahead and try to figure out how do we explicitly calculate the integral of this between two to eight and six to 10. The way we do that is to utilize integration techniques. Now, what I'm now going to ask here, I'm a, I want to calculate the integral. I'm going to call this rectangle R. And I want to calculate the integral, remember this, the integral of f of xy over my domain R. How do I calculate that, right? The goal of this to calculate f of x, to calculate this, well, I need to remember what dA is first off. I need to think about how do I write this fully out, right? What does this actually mean? This is the net volume from my, my height of xy to my xy plane. And specifically, right, this will be over a rectangle. So how am I going to write this? Well, what I usually do in, in writing this, I have this double interval here because I have to go over to my x-axis and my y-axis here. So, you can write this however you would like, honestly. Many times you'll, you'll see something like this. Well, you'll have A to B and C to D of F of X, Y, DX, DY. You'll see something like this. Now, how you go about integrating something like this? In this case, what we'll do is we'll integrate with respect to X first and then with Y. Let's just say that, okay? So I'm gonna integrate this X times Y I'm going to go dx first and then dy. You start with the inside terms and then you move to the outside. This is really important to remember. I start with the insides and move towards the outsides. 2 to 8 and 6 to 10. So this tells me right here, if I'm just looking at this right here, this tells me everything here, this is really important. This says the following. I am integrating the function x times y. I am integrating first with respect to x, and I'm integrating that between the numbers two and eight. I am then also integrating with respect to y, and then I'm integrating that with between six and 10. Many times you are not allowed to flip these. In this case, I'm going to do x first because it's on the inside. Whichever one's on the inside first, you do. Then you move towards the outside. So now how do I actually go about integrating this? Well. Let's think about it this way. How did I differentiate with respect to x? The degree I let y be a constant, right? I let y be a constant, and I just integrated x as I would. This is the same exact way because, again, I'm holding y to be a constant, which is nice. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take x. I'm going to integrate this as I would if y was a constant, okay? So let's integrate this with respect to x if y was a constant. So imagine if I just had something like 
the integral of two times, uh, two times x. How would I integrate that? Well, let's even do something a little bit better. Let's do four times x. If that was the integral of four x here, right, the integral of this is just two x squared. So if I'm integrating x times y, y is a constant. And so what you can do is I can just integrate this with respect to x. I would get x squared over 2 times y. y just stays there. So this becomes the integral from now 6 to 10 of x squared over 2 times y. We just integrated x. We left y be a constant. Now what we do, we're going to evaluate this at x is equal to 2 to x is equal to 8. dy. dy is still out there. We need to evaluate this first, however. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm now going to plug in 8 to this. I'm going to plug in 2. y can get pulled out because that's a constant. So this just becomes then 8 here, which is going to be 8 squared over 2 which is 32, subtracted from 2 squared over 2, which is just 2 dy. So this now is 6 to 10, 30y dy. And now I'm left to this point. It's just a function of y, and I can integrate it just as I want to. The integral of 30y, in this case, is just 15y squared. And this is evaluated now between 6 to 10. And we would get that this is 15, 100 minus 36, which is equal to 15 times 64. And is this a nice number? This is 960. Yes, 960. And that is our answer. So what did we do? Just out of curiosity, just to show you, what did we do? This, this said right here, okay, I'm going to integrate with respect to x first because I'm on the inside, and then I'm going to integrate with respect to y. This is going to come in so, so much importance going down the line. So please make sure you get that point. This means the inside means, uh, you know, you do this one first, and you do this one second. This one corresponds to this x. This one corresponds to this y. You can just go backwards, too. It's a pretty important thing to do that. And what we do is if I'm integrating with respect to x, I let y be a constant. Same exact thing as differentiation. Let y be a constant, integrate that, then evaluate it. And then similarly, what we do again is I just evaluate that at, the, at those points. And then I go ahead and do it again. And again, my answer is 960. So as you can see, that, over, that was a very, very over, um, overestimate for my three months time before. So lastly here, and the last thing I'm going to talk about, at least in this video, does it matter if I then integrate with respect to y first and then with respect to x? Does that matter? It's a very valid question. So let's see something else. Would it have mattered? Am I allowed to do this, for instance? My question to you is, am I allowed to instead integrate with respect to y and then x? using these same exact numbers. I'm gonna integrate from six to 10, and then from two to eight. Can I do that? And the answer is, is actually yes, you can. You can go ahead and through this now and do the same exact thing. I'll do this very quickly. x, y squared over two, going from six to 10, dx. This again is going to be uh, 64 x dx, which then this comes out to 32x squared from 2 to 8, which again then admits exactly what we had before, which is 960. So I'm allowed to. So this actually says something really interesting. This says, and this actually is a really important theorem called Flubini's theorem. Actually, a couple of really cool theorems that we're going to tackle. Tackle one more today, just to kind of, I'm not going to really prove it, but it's a really important one. So kind of as a reminder, if I am in a rectangle and this only, and I'm, I'm 
I'm going to stress this so hard. This says right here, as again, I'm integrating with respect to X from A to B, right? X runs from A to B. I'm gonna do it this way. And Y runs, we see Y runs from C to D. And I'm integrating with respect to X first and then Y. For a rectangle only, and this is only a rectangle, this is equal to, you are allowed to flip the limits. This becomes then from C to D and A to B. We can integrate this with respect to Y and then X. This does not always happen, and this is called Fubini's theorem. A really phenomenal mathematician, Fubini. This is a very important concept that says that I'm allowed to integrate any way I would like in a rectangle or any cube if you want to keep going. You can integrate that seven times. If it's all constants, you can integrate however you want. It's the same thing kind of with, um, you know, Clarot's theorem in a way. Um, Clarot's theorem says I'm allowed to, you know, differentiate at any time if everything's continuous. This is a very specific case, though, for integration. Integration is supposed to be very difficult. Um, just in general, integration is a very hard thing to do. So this is Fubini's theorem. It says you're allowed to flip these. Now, one last thing I'll show you to kind of simplify some calculations, too, and you might not kind of realize this off the bat. If I have a function, and this is, again, only for stuff like this, only for rectangles. If I have a function, something called, we'll call a separable function, which means that I can have a function of x times a function of y. So what does this look like? Something like, you know, x squared times y. This is my g of x. This is my y. This is my h of y. Maybe something like, sine of x, cosine of y. This is separable in this case. This, for instance, is not. x plus y is not separable. I cannot write this as g of x times h of y, because I have an addition sign here. If you have this, which is a separable equation, what you can do is you can integrate the x part and the y part individually, and then multiply them together at the end. Because why is that? Think about why that is h is a constant, right? h is a constant. So right, I can pull this out if, it's, if I'm integrating with respect to x. This h of y is a constant, so I can actually pull that out of the integral. So this can really become c to d, h times y, and then really the integral from a to b of g of x, dx, still dy. And now what's even better is this itself is a constant. This is a number. This integral is a number. So let's pull that out of this integral. And what you get is this fun thing here. What you can do is a separable equation. You are allowed to individually calculate the integral with respect to x and the integral with respect to y by itself and then multiply them together at the end. Again, this only happens with rectangles. Once we start getting into the general regions of integration, this starts to become a little bit tricky, okay? Now, again, I want you to think about this F here, and this, and this F in an integral. It is the net volume, this entire integral is the net volume below, um, your, it's the net volume between the F of XY and the XY plane. Again, this could be negative, this could be positive, it could be zero. As many times as well, it can be zero. If you're ever asked to calculate this f of x, y, maybe, and think about the volume, you want to think about the heights, right? What's the highest point? What's the lowest point? And subtract them. In that case, if you have two, two functions, maybe it's bounded above by something, bounded below by something else, subtract them. That will be your function height. Stuff like this will help you integrate these faster. So I hope this, this, this shows you some really interesting things. Integration will become a lot more... Um, intricate as we get into there. And even just a slight thing of, just a really simple region that's not even rectangular, it doesn't cause us a lot of issues, but it still is gonna be a little bit tougher to integrate here, because we don't have nice constants anymore. So with that in mind, uh, if you have any questions, let me know. I hope this was informational and all that. Uh, and yeah, I hope you have a great weekend. It's actually Thursday. Yeah, it's Thursday, but have a good weekend regardless. Uh, it's beautiful out the last couple of days, so I hope you get out and hope everybody's staying safe and sound and yeah maybe next time i'll have different colors i think i'm going to try to have 
different colored pens. We'll see what happens. All right, have a good one, and I'll talk to you soon.